success. Terry, I think you muted yourself on accident. I'll try again. I did. Thank there you, we go. Jared. Boom, we can hear you. Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to our Lunch and Learn on setting your new hires up for success. We are excited that all of you have joined us today. My name is Terry Carlson and I am the senior sales exec executive for Corwell Health. We would like to kindly request you keep your microphones muted and place your questions in the chat. We will be recording the webinar. Following the webinar, we will be sending the recording and slide deck out via email. We have a star-studded lineup of panelists. First up is Andrew Cassini, employment law attorney from Penn Lesbrance. Second up is Dr. Natalie Debonardi, our occupational health physician site lead. And last is Chris Golton, insurance and safety consultant with BHS Insurance. Also joining the panelists is Dan Adams, our RN case manager. Let's get started, Andrew. All right, perfect. Thank you, Terry, and thank you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to speak with the panel today. And, um, you know, what I'd like to indicate, especially at the onset, is that when we're talking about setting up new hires for success, in particular, we're talking about the very popular topic that tends to be a source of substantial confusion for employers, which is the issue of whether or not uh, we can allow for pre-employment fitness for duty inquiries that is to say pre-employment, but post-offer fitness for duty inquiries. This is an area that a lot of people scratch their heads over, and I understand why. It's because the law is a little bit arcane. It's a little bit of a maze, and it's unfortunately the kind of situation where if you just try to feel your way through it, it may not always be a successful outcome, but we're here to guide you through that. So, um, Terry, can I, uh, is this the thing where I can take control of the presentation to advance slides? Ah, okay. I uh, go ahead in and any event, the next slide and I'll go ahead and take it from there. Perfect. That's great. So, um, yeah, I understand kicking off a meeting with the attorney talking is not always the way that you want to proceed, but I do actually have a, a perspective that I hope will be invaluable for you guys today. Uh, this is very much a situation where it is a maze and I can help you see through it to a degree. So let's go on to that next slide. Um, what I want you guys to understand, and what are we talking about first? Well, we're talking about post-offer pre-employment fitness for duty examinations. What do we mean by post-offer pre-employment? Post-offer means that you've already extended a conditional job offer to the employee. You've already accepted their application. You've already gone through the process of interviewing them. You've reviewed their resume. You've determined that they're the right person for the job, so long as, that's the conditional part, they're able to meet your reasonable job-related uh, fitness for duty standards, and so long as they pass the examination that you've notified them will be coming at the end of the day. Well, fitness for duty examinations, those are, and lifting tests is one of the primary ones that you see most frequently, those are legally permissible screening tools. And they're legally permissible under federal and state law, but the real key is that you've got to be able to implement it correctly, and the devil will be in the details here. My goal is to give you guys a pretty simple step-by-step -step approach for trying to figure out what are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about here. What I don't want is for you guys to feel like you're looking out at a minefield. The reason landmines are scary, well, yeah, they explode and can hurt or kill you. But the real reason landmines are scary is because you don't know where they are. My goal is to be able to chart you a course where you can identify where those landmines are to make sure that you don't step on any. Let's go ahead and advance the slide. So where does this come from? Why is this an issue and what are what is stopping us from doing whatever we want to do, given that we are an at-will state? Well, there are two laws that form that foundation. The first is the ADA. The ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the federal law, that mandates that fitness for duty examinations have to be both job-related and consistent with business necessity. Those are two prongs. 
job related means they can't be arbitrary. You can't make somebody do a sit up contest. And then at the end of the day, the person with the most sit ups gets to do the job of uh, CEO of your company. There's no, it's not like Festivus. There are no feats of strength. Instead, it has to actually be tied into the requirements of the job and has to be related to them in that way. And then it must also be consistent with business necessity. You need to be able to perform that examination in order to make sure that you get candidates to hire. You need to prove both prongs or be ready to, lest you administer an unlawful fitness for duty exam. And the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act, that's the little mini-me version of the ADA that is under uh, Michigan state law, has actually a specific statutory provision, which is MCL 372-12021D, which actually goes forward to prohibit employers from refusing to hire or promote candidates on the basis of mental, physical or mental examinations that are not directly related to the requirements for the specific job. Well, Look at those two different standards together, and what do you see? You see that they're very similar to each other. That's a good thing for you because it means that we can chart one path for compliance using the following steps. Let's go ahead and advance the slide. If you think about it, all of this makes sense too. I always like, before I give a description about what we need to do in the order in which we need to do it, I always like to take a big step back and say, let's think about what the overall purpose of these things are, so that if we ever get ourselves into a situation where we forget exactly what we need to do, we can remember the bedrock principles so we can act in compliance with those. The purpose of the ADA and the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act, really broadly, is to prevent stereotypes about various conditions or about physical conditions about persons with disabilities from impacting and coming into the job-related analysis. But of course, remember, both the ADA and the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act, they permit you as an employer to make a determination about the essential functions of jobs, and then to determine that a person who can't do the essential functions of the job aren't entitled to get hired into yours. In other words, the idea behind the ADA and the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act is at all times to prevent a stereotype about a person's condition from, from leading us to assume that they can't do a job. Instead, we have to test that. We have to individually assess that. We have to say, can this person, as opposed to just a classification or an assumption, can this person do this job? That's the analysis overall we need to make. Let's advance the slide. So what's the first thing? The first thing to do is to make sure that we're in compliance with the standards at all, which is we need to determine the business necessity of the lifting test. How do we do that? Well, we do that based on an assessment that is made of the individual position offered for hire, and that's key. You don't just make an assumption that is industry-wide. You don't make an assumption about people that work in our factory must do A, B, and C just because they work in our factory. No, you actually have to go one step farther and you have to say to yourself, does this specific position require a person to be able to lift a certain amount? Are we sure about that? Does the job incidentally or directly always require that exercise of lifting? Well, if it does, then we can proceed. We can move on. And the way that we do that is let's break it down. We need to analyze the job specific steps to determine the specific requirements that will be subject to the testing that we want to do. Because remember, the test needs to be consistent with the business necessity, and the test also needs to be reasonably job related. So in other words, we don't get to just set an overall standard. In fact, this is an area where some fire and police departments have recently come into a great deal of controversy and have fallen and follow the EEOC. They'll do things like say, hey, how fast can you run a mile? A mile time will be assessed, and then they'll have a person with a stopwatch, and this has been something that they've been doing since 1850. Well, under certain circumstances, that's more than okay. After all, the job of being a firefighter or a police officer, arguably your physical endurance is job-related and consistent with business necessity. But is that the case for somebody who's maybe working in the evidence room? There, it's a harder analysis to make, and you need to make that individual determination based on each job. Let's advance the slide. Also, you need to make sure that the cardinal rule of HR is followed. HR has three covenants, three essential rules, and thankfully they're all the same. Thou must document, thou must document, thou must document. We need to ensure before we order a fitness for duty examination that the reasons, the essential functions necessitating that FFD are documented. Now, the gold standard would be if you have a lifting requirement, for example, is that listed in the job description? If not, why not? It should be. Now, you need to be wary, though, before you just put pen to paper and make a whole bunch of changes. One, 
is that consistent with prior accommodations that you've granted for the job? Certainly, the fact that you've granted a prior accommodation to one employee significantly increases the chances that a blanket requirement prohibiting anybody from getting the job unless they're able to fulfill that requirement would be rendered unlawful. In other words, the fact that we've given an accommodation where maybe we said, you know what, actually, we can modify the jobs so that lifting isn't essential. Well, you've just undermined your argument that it is, in fact, job related and consistent with business necessity. So be aware of those. And also be aware of your written policies or procedures that maybe suggest that lifting is optional. This bites a lot of employers too. Situations where there are multiple different ways of doing a job and it's been distilled down into writing. Well, maybe nobody actually does it the way that the third policy reads, but if it did and that didn't require lifting, you've made it a lot harder for you to argue that lifting is an essential function that is both job related and consistent with business necessity. And then if you did a lifting test to try to hire somebody for that job, you put yourself behind the eight ball. Let's advance the slide. Step three, um, work with your third party provider. You know, Spectrum Occupational Health is here today to talk about um, the services that they offer uh, to administer the tests that you decide to select uniformly and post offer, but pre hire. Uniformity is essential. That one's easy. It is extremely risky to subject only certain candidates for a job to any FFD. In other words, if you're going to say that a fitness for duty test is a prerequisite for a certain job, I would be ready to screen all candidates through that process, maybe with an exception of whether or not they have passed an equivalent or greater FFD within your organization within a certain period of time. Otherwise, though, you've got to send everybody through it. Singling people out is undermining your own arguments uh, that it is legally permissible. You also need to make sure the steps are administered at the right time. Although we warn applicants that an FFD is required pre-offer, we extend it only after the conditional offer goes out. We administer the test post-offer, and then we revoke that offer to the extent that the test comes back with a, with a failing grade. Let's advance the slide. Step four, you then need to perform the interactive process of reasonable accommodations with individuals who fail the test. This is important and this is key. A lot of people think, look, we've gone through the entirety of the uh, of the process to try to make sure and ensure that our FFD procedure and process comports the law. And then they decide to maybe get a little bit complacent and they just reject anybody that doesn't pass the test. You still need to perform that interactive process analysis with every single candidate that you've given a conditional offer to, even if they fail. Don't revoke the offers without going through that accommodation process, but be wary that modifying job duties, if you do make that as an accommodation, you've just undermined your own argument that it's job related and consistent with business necessity. Now, what am I saying when I'm saying going through the accommodation process? There will be some candidates that fail the FFD that you will not be able to hire, but you need to go through that interactive process to ensure that there isn't something easy. Is there a piece of accommodative equipment? Um, what is the nature of the disability matched up against the inability to pass the test that is creating the failing grade on it? Well, once you determine that, you can determine whether or not that's something that you can work with and whether or not an accommodation is reasonable, but that's the analysis that you still need to go through. Next slide. Number five. Be wary after that of disparate impact, especially when that comes to strength testing. Unfortunately, one of the one of the essential maxims that we are beginning to realize, many athletes can tell you this, is that there will be for strength testing a enormous disparate impact between male and female candidates. The ADA and the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act is not your only obstacle to a legal FFD. You also have to ensure that the FFD that you've implemented doesn't create a disparate impact over time in any protected class. Obviously, the number one would be based on sex, which is to say women and men may not be able to meet at the same proportion a lifting standard. You are still able to maintain it so long as you can prove, one, it's safe and related to job performance and consistent with business necessity. That's a threshold showing that you already made to get the FFD in the first place. But you also have to be willing to prepare to say that it's the least discriminatory alternative. You got to be willing and able to defend and say, no, doing this lifting test because of the nature of the position really did require us to administer the test. And there really isn't an easier, less discriminatory way for us to be able to do it. It isn't, for example, this would be the kind of thing that I would be prepared to prove. And the folks over with your third party provider can help you. 
It isn't the fact that women are disproportionately screened out by the test. It's that there's a separate amount of women and men who can do the job. If that's true, if it's truly the least discriminatory alternative and it is consistent with safe and efficient job performance and business necessity, then you're good to go. But be aware you will not need to clear that hurdle. Let's advance the slide. Then we finally need to revisit the job periodically. This sounds obvious, but it's not. Jobs change over time. We need to ensure that an FFD that maybe we implemented for a particular provision years ago maintains consistency with business necessity by virtue of consistency with the job. Did the job itself change? Do we maybe not need to lift as much anymore? Did the equipment used in the job change such that we no longer need to lift physically with our muscles? Now we have assistive equipment, but we're still using a standard from a prior age. Or is the policies and procedures about how to do the job, are those still consistent? Basically, don't let the job change out from under you, but keep the same existing FFD framework, because that may mean that an FFD that was perfectly lawful three or four years ago, to the extent the job changes, that legality status may change too. Don't get caught by that one. Let's advance the slide. That's all for me. I'm going to hand you on over to uh, Dr. Natalie here, who's going to be to discussing the next section of our presentation, and I will be sticking around for the Q&A as well. So thank you all for your time. Hello, thank you again for taking the time to join us today. Um, I'm Dr. Natalie Debernardi. I'm the site lead for occupational health here at Corwell Health. Um, I am also board certified in occupational and environmental medicine. We'll go ahead and start the slides. So today we're going to talk about lift tests. First, I'm going to start with why. Uh, we've heard a little bit um, from our legal, legal sector um, regarding why are lift tests an area of opportunity. They, in short, offer a brief assessment that is quite simple to um, evaluate the ability of an employee and also look at their technique. We here at Corwell Health, Occupational Health, offer those lift tests and they're pretty simple to do. Most commonly, we do 50 pound lift tests with 10 reps, but they can even be as limited as four reps um, as some companies may decide to do so. We are able to perform in clinic up to 75 pounds, but that is done in increments to keep our employees safe. Next slide, please. So as we've already discussed um, and a lot more in depth than I had planned to do so, these are ADA compliant or should be um, if you follow the steps that we have recently heard from the legal sector. Um, they also further screen the physical condition and joint function of the employee. It further, it's an opportunity for the employee to have further understanding of lifting technique and the reasons why it's important to lift in a safe manner. These lift tests that are done in clinic also um, leave opportunity to evaluate the lifting form and give immediate constructive feedback of how to improve lifting form to keep our employees safe. The results from this test also assist us in determining the employee's capability and uh, to safely perform the functions of the job. If an employee should perhaps be unable to lift the required load, we are able to determine the ability that they are able to lift, so that information will be given to you. For example, perhaps they can't lift the 50 pounds, um, but they're able to do so lift 25 pounds safely and with good form. This can be noted. Also on the forms that um, state whether there is a pass or fail, it states how much effort and the employee had to put forth during the testing, which could also give you a, an idea whether the employee should need further assistance and maybe getting up to speed if it's a repetitive lifting job. This lift testing that is done in clinic can also assist in ensuring that employees are not placed in lifting environments that are well beyond their capabilities. We want to be able to say that these employees are safe to do so. This testing improves worker safety and potentially can reduce work-related injuries. Next slide, please. 
So who should do these lift tests? So as we have just previously heard, employees in job positions that require heavy lifting or they're physically demanding. So things that I think of immediately are jobs that require lifting product, potentially even transferring people. Think about our assemblers, our warehouse employees, our, um, our MAs, our CNAs, just for, to name a few. Also, we talked about fitness for duty evaluations, not just the ones that are done in clinic for, for physical, for the post-offer exams, but if there's a question of fitness for duty, if they're able to do to lift. The other um, idea for who might be able to do lift test would be someone who is returning to work after a personal medical condition. Um, often those are incorporated in a fitness for duty evaluation or a return to work. Next slide, please. So where? These are easily done right here in our clinics. Um, our, tr our staff, our clinical staff has been trained with proper ergonomic lifting techniques and they undergo refreshing, refreshers throughout um, their time with us. They're easily done as stated at the time of the physical exam. Next slide. All right, my name is Chris Golden. I work for BHS Insurance. Just a quick brief history about myself. Um, before working for BHS, I went to Grand Valley State for my occupational safety and health degree. Uh, anchor up, go Lakers. Um, after that, I worked in a couple different industries uh, from warehousing distribution to food processing to manufacturing, specifically a uh, tier two automotive um, uh, field. Uh, next slide for me, please. So how can, from an insurance standpoint, um, when I switched over to insurance coming from your side, um, the insured side, a little bit different mindset here. So how can these services affect um, your insurance rates? Um, one thing we need to understand without getting too deep is something called your experience modification rate. That is just simply a metric the insurance um, industry uses to aid and uh, help in assessing um, the cost of your insurance. So one thing to understand, just like back in grade school, when you talked about uh, the pH balance of something, 7.0 is it, um, 1.0 for a modification rate is average. Average isn't always a bad thing. Um, you can do worse, you can do better. Um, so if your actual losses are less than um, what you expected, you are under a 1.0. Um, if they're worse, you're over a 1.0. Um, but 1.0 is exactly average. So how much better than average are you or would you like to be? Um, your mind is affected by the number of losses that, that your company incurs, the frequency and severity. Um, severity is weighed a little more heavily than the frequency. Um, it's not as bad to have a number of small injuries versus that one large injury uh, where the severity is large. Next slide, please. One thing about the modification rate, every industry has it. Um, when you have a 1.0 modification rate, you are compared to your peers in that industry. So um, a hospital would not be compared to a brewery who would not be compared to um, a metal stamping shop or any other industry. Um, you're always got, or you're always um, compared to your peers. So, a modification rate um, for one in a hospital versus a brewery are completely different. Uh, but how does this affect your insurance rates? Let's just use a nice round number of a hundred thousand dollars for insurance premium. Um, if you have a lot of injuries and your and your mod rate is one point two five, you can see by the numbers there you're paying twenty five thousand dollars more. Um, on the flip side, if you are less than one and you don't have injuries, you have a good healthy safety program and your mod is a 0.8, you're getting a 20% discount. You're saving $80,000. So that's just nice round numbers. I've had a client who had a $2 million work comp premium. Um, so you know that they are watching their modification rate. If they can reduce that by 10%, they're saving $200,000. Um, 
everybody on here knows insurance is not cheap. It doesn't matter if it's for your work, for your car, for your health. Insurance just costs a lot. So if you can reduce it, why would you not want to go ahead and do that? So why don't we go to the next slide, please? Why the lift test? Again, from, from a safety manager standpoint, one, this is objective feedback. You send them into somewhere like Cornwall Health. Um, it's not a personal opinion. These are standardized tests requiring uh, the physical test of the candidate's agility. It can prevent workplace injuries. I've got my next slide coming up in a little bit is a is a real world um, example that we'll go over. Um, these tests really help identify if the person can do the job that you have. Every company is different. Every industry is different. You've got your job description. It's good to know if that person can do that job before you hire them. Um, and as stated before, uh, reducing the risk of injury, this actually benefits everybody involved. It, it benefits that, that specific candidate. It benefits other employees. It benefits the company. It's a win-win for everybody. Uh, next slide, please. So in the example here, uh, I was sitting in one of my client's uh, safety committees, and as we got to the part of the meeting where we go over and review uh, previous injuries, this happened to be a brewery. Um, not going to go over the full job description, but part of it was moving full cases of beer, uh, possibly moving full cases or full kegs of beer. Um, they could be empty. They could be partially full. Um, awkward. You're going to, um, you could have a full keg, a quarter barrel, all different sizes, all different weights. Uh, they ended up having an employee who had multiple uh, back injuries, um, less than a year of employment. And the question popped up in the safety committee is, how can we avoid this? This is turning into a, a long, costly injury. The employee is off work, sitting at home. So they're hurt. The company is not benefiting from having them work. Um, this affects their production. It affects their efficiency. It affects their quality of the product because now you have to either bring in a substitute or hire a new person. So you have to go through that whole process now of hiring a new person. How could we have just avoided this? We want our employees healthy. We want them working. We want them to come in and leave in the same condition. It's good for them. It's good for the company. And my question to them instantly was, why have we not in instituted the fit for duty tests? And as we've heard earlier, this is the legal measure for asking the questions that all HR directors know they can't ask. You can't ask the medical history of, of a candidate. So this is why we send them in, we get these tests done, and if they come back with a failing grade, you have basically, um, it's an easy return on investment to come back to your company and say, I'm gonna spend the money that it costs to do these tests to avoid these injuries. So one back injury, one elbow injury, a shoulder, um, that can easily outweigh the cost of doing one of these tests. So in the long run, you spend the money up front to save a large amount of money in the back end. And, and this can go to any field. It doesn't have to be a brewery. It can be a stamping shop. It can be a hospital, anywhere where people are doing heavy physical uh, work. And like I was stated before, it doesn't have to be for every employee. If you've identified it in the job description, identify that this particular job has these duties, can this person handle these? And this is the way to go about finding out if they can or can't. Not saying that it's going to completely eliminate the risk of a job injury, but you are stacking the, the cards in your favor uh, by, by eliminating certain candidates that you know that can't do the uh, do the position. So that's all I've got. It looks like we're turning it over to the question and answer portion. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, we do have some questions in the chat that we'd like to um, direct to the appropriate panelists. Um, the first question we have, I believe, goes to Andrew. What do you recommend if an applicant passes the FFE upon hire, then who change jobs after employment is started and who may have failed and they applied for the second job? 
Okay, so the way I understand this question to be presented is that they initially passed an FFD for position A, then they wanted to be transferred to position B, but failed the job uh, transfer to position B. Um, well, I, what I would suggest to this instance is you go through the process of the reasonable accommodation. Is it possible for us to make a reasonable accommodation such that they could do position B? But to the extent that you cannot reasonably accommodate it, you go through the interactive process and you're unable to do it. Then I think the answer is either they stay with position A or alternatively, uh, at that point in time, um, to the extent that for whatever reason, position A has been eliminated, uh, at that point in time, if there aren't alternative jobs within your organization available for which you may want to give them a tryout out of the kindness of your own heart, you're not uh, required as a reasonable accommodation to give that option to another employee, uh, perhaps then it's not the organization they should be work working for any longer. Now, obviously, till the extent that uh, we've got a situation where somebody's medical condition has changed significantly. Also be aware that the direct threat analysis allows us to subject an employee, a current employee, to some form of reasonable medical testing to the extent that the medical test is job related and consistent with business necessities. Same standard. So to the extent that we have an emerging concern, that's the avenue that we take. We take a direct threat analysis. We don't believe we have in order to 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 to. Uh, qualify for that threshold to do so, we need to have some sort of objective measure by which we can say we have concerns because of A, B, and C that you'd be unable to do the job that you once did and continue to do it. We need to have those objective measures, but if we are able to do that and defend it, we can subject them to an FFD at that time. Thank you, Andrew. Um, the other question or the next question up in the chat are there similar requirements for a skills test? Does it matter if it's the test around last round of interviews, pre-offer or post-offer? I think this one also gets directed to you, Andrew. Yeah, no problem, Terry. So great question. Uh, the issue is whether or not the skills test qualifies as a physical or mental examination. How will that process be determined? Well, that's hard to say. A lot of skills tests will qualify. Certainly, um, you know, not that this is a, were we to be having this conversation in 1964, we might discuss how uh, various forms of intelligence testing or aptitude testing was sometimes required. That is a thorny or sticky situation. That's the key though. Skills testing is not controlled by the ADA or by the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act, so long as that skill testing is unrelated to the mental health condition or the physical condition of an employee. So in other words, do you have a coding test that you wanna give somebody? Do you know C++ or whatever that it might be? I'm an, I'm an old guy now, C++ is the language that I'm familiar with. There may be more modern ones, I don't know. I don't know anything about coding. I don't know anything about computers. But point being, that can be something that we can do. Why? Because that isn't a test of somebody's mental or physical health condition. There'd be no threshold to entry for those. Thank you, Andrew. Um, this question is getting directed to Natalie. Um, in your practice, do you see that lift tests prevent injuries? Can you give any examples? I would say it definitely is an opportunity here to decrease um, injuries in this regard. And we've actually heard a great example um, with a keg scenario that unfortunately far too common I have seen present to my clinic um, with a with some of our employers that have to lift those heavy, heavy kegs, cases, wine, um, cases of wine. So that exact example I have seen on numerous occasions as well. Um, I, I would have to say that here, see something when evaluation in clinic it is very short-lived it is is it is a few minutes um with some time for for recap and and feedback however in the workplace I recommend continued guidance of lifting technique. So this is another example of when our athletic trainers could come in and see if there's ergonomic issues um, to just kind of further the understanding of proper lifting. I think another biggest area 
um, in which that we could prevent injuries, and I have seen injuries, I, well, I can assume that injuries have been prevented here, is when the employee just does not have the physical capability, whether it be due to an orthopedic injury condition or deconditioning, um, to be able to physically lift the amount that is requested. By doing the lift test um, and uh, being unable to lift at a certain point, the, we're able to say how much a employee can safely lift and then further information is carried back to the employer. So long-winded answer, but yes. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, next question is going to Chris. Um, from your experience, how has implementing a lift test impacted the employer's bottom line? Well, um, let's go back to that, that brewery example. Um, it's always, your hindsight's always 2020. But in that case, they hired the employee. They weren't doing these tests. They didn't do the lift test. The employee over the next, over the course of their first year of employment, side note, most injuries occur within the first year. So uh, Terry will definitely agree with that one there. Um, another reason why you want to do these tests before if you have a physical labor. Uh, but in terms of this brewery, um, if they would have done this test and this candidate would have um, been excluded from the position, uh, they would have avoided uh, two injuries. Um, so inside that injury, you've got insurance costs, um, lost production, lost efficiency, lost quality. Um, if in the end that this employee cannot come back from this injury, you've got to hire a new person. So think of all the uh, human resources that have to go through finding a new candidate, interviewing, onboarding, training. Um, there's so many intangibles that if you can reduce or eliminate these injuries, um, there's a lot of statistics out there that actually prove too that the less injuries you have, so if you spend money up front on a good qualified safety program, the less injuries you have, your efficiency will go up, your quality will go up, your employee health will go up. Um, so just, just all around, it is a good thing for a company. The bad thing about safety is it's hard to directly tie uh, cost to injuries that you haven't had happen. It's easy when you have a back injury to take a $50,000 claim or a $50,000 loss if you're self-insured and pinpoint that from an accounting standpoint, say this cost us $50,000. Um, so you can go back and track your injuries. If you have, let's say 30 injuries one year and 20 injuries the next year, and then the third year you're down to 10 injuries, um, there's no direct dollar amount to put those, to those injuries that you didn't have happen. So it's kind of a leap of faith that you're, you're eliminating these injuries, so therefore you're not paying them. Thank you, Chris. Um, next question is back to Andrew. What about the clause not limited to or other duties as required when you don't want to change the job description? Sure. Well, uh, can you rely on that as your documentary evidence to be able to demonstrate that it's job related and consistent with business necessity? You certainly can. Yes, obviously. A anything can be. The number one rule of HR being document, document, document is because it is all comes down to whether or not at the end of the day we are able to prove that it is job related and consistent with business necessity. Remember, if this ever were to go to trial, let's imagine a hypothetical situation where you exclude a candidate, that candidate sues you, you go uh, through a lawsuit, it ends up in trial. At the end of the day, how as a lawyer am I able to prove that a particular job is going to have a lifting requirement tied to it? Well, I'm going to take the job description, but if the job description doesn't list it, you're going to get asked, why doesn't it list it? Does it not list it because it isn't real or does it not list it because it hasn't been updated? then we've got to go through the process of testimony. We've got to put witnesses on to be able to demonstrate, oh yeah, that is how that job works and here's how it is uh, requires it. And of course, you're going to get contrary testimony from the plaintiff. It didn't require it at all. They made me do it. They excluded me unfairly. Point being, yes, you can rely on that, but it's an awfully big risk to take. What you're doing is that you're essentially implementing a FFD on little or no documentary evidence, that makes it much harder for the lawyer at the end of the day to prove the case and may mean that the practice is ultimately invalidated. That's why we suggest it. 
Is there a bright line rule that says a job description without a lifting requirement in it can never have an FFD under it? No, but that is not my recommendation ever to any of my clients. I think it's a pretty easy and simple solve that doesn't take much more than just the addition and revision of a job description, as long as it's, of course, consistent with the actual practice. I think to your point too, Andrew, it reinforces the importance of having functional job descriptions so that when you look at that job description, it actually shows what the functional physical demands are and the requirements of those positions. So um, great point. Next question. Um, can you ask a candidate if they require special accommodations to perform the job? I believe this one's back to you again, Andrew. Sure, uh, you certainly can notify them. This is the way I recommend that employers do it. I recommend that you, as part of your job application or as part of your early onboarding process during the interview process, disclose the notice to your candidates which is available under the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act, that in order to be eligible to make an accommodation request, they need to make that accommodation request within 182 days of knowing that they need it. I recommend having that incorporated into a part of most of my application text is where you'll find that. The job application itself is written on there. Hey, just be aware this is a requirement that we have. Um, and that's the way that I normally implement it. Asking it in an interview in and of itself, usually I like to do it in a passive way as opposed to an, in, 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 as opposed to an a direct method, but there is nothing that's per se unlawful about doing that. I just think that it does complicate the picture of hiring substantially. Thank you. Um, this question is for Natalie. Are there any skills tests for extended standing? So that's a great question. Um, currently, we do not have anything specifically, but I'm sure I could think of something. The problem with uh, testing if somebody can stand for a prolonged period would be time, right? Time to be able to see and witness um, that. But I have been in my past creative, and uh, maybe if we are able to talk uh, at the future and kind of see what what have you seen in your employees that you have concerns about, perhaps we can put some type of a skill set together for you. Um, but time would be the limitation, the time that we have in clinic to actually visualize how long somebody can stand. So um, please, I would I welcome further conversation with whomever asked that question so we can help you in that regard. Thank you. Any thoughts or input you have on this question, Chris, from a safety perspective? Yeah, I would agree with with Natalie there. It's it's hard to test standing. Um, everybody has a different body type. You're looking at different different jobs, different um, different manufacturing settings, different industries. Um, so just determining just a alone by itself standing um i think that would be tough we see that from an injury standpoint when somebody goes in for injury and comes back you know with a job modification or restriction they can only stand for x amount of time so from a medical standpoint it's i would if, just my opinion it's easier to um limit how much somebody can stand versus testing how long somebody can actually stand thank you um this question is um, for Natalie. What other tests would you recommend for pre-employment screenings? I know a lot of these are related to specific jobs, but um, what about dexterity testing? Or uh, what are other types of testing that you've seen for pre-employment? Thank you, Terry. That's a great question. Um, but I'd like to once again bring up a, a topic that everybody has said within the panel how important um, job descriptions are. So job descriptions are incredibly helpful for us as providers to kind of better understand what type of capabilities um, we are looking for in the employee. That being said, I just want to touch briefly on what our general physical looks like, just the run-of-the-mill general physical. 
we get a past medical history, which we review in detail with the with the employee. We also get vitals to be sure if we have further testing or um, to be sure their blood pressure is well controlled, uh, their heart rate isn't incredibly fast, and if need be, we um, give them letters to follow up with their primary care providers. We do vision testing, distant vision testing, and we also look at red, green, blue, and yellow. So that's kind of the basic package in that regard. Further testing may be, uh, may be determined as per the provider at the time. But further testing that we do offer uh, that are kind of skills tests in some way or another is the Ishihara, for example, and that's further examining red green color deficiencies. So that is an incredibly sensitive, so 97% sensitive and 100% specific. So both of those are very well satisfied if a red green color deficiency is important or critical to the job that the employee will be performing. Also, we do titmus testing. So that's another specific vision further testing that we look at. Um, we use this visual screening device, and basically we simulate distant vision um, as well as near vision. So think about those employees that maybe have to read some fine print. Um, it, it, it is imperative for that they be able to read from a distance as well as far, and this may also impact their safety. Um, also, it does stereograms or looking at depth perception, which may be important for some jobs as well. But for all of these tests, it's very important that we have job descriptions. It also looks at color, um, being able to determine color. Just to briefly go on, looking at the comprehensive back exam that we also offer. So this is a further examination, which I incorporate to some degree in my general physical examinations, but this further examines the back and how well, they're mo how well the employee um, is able to mobilize in the clinic. Um, it has further questions in regard to back history, and I think it's definitely beneficial in these heavy lifting jobs. Next, I'd like to touch base on the hand and wrist exam that we offer. These are good for jobs that, that require repetitive pinch, grip, grasp, awkward wrist positions, um, which we hope they don't do very often, and also use of vibrational tools. So what I'm getting at here is hand and wrist issues, um, namely carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is one that I identified an individual with uh, very active and bothersome carpal tunnel in the bilateral, so hand, uh, right hand and left hand at the wrist, um, and was applying for a position that would be um, known to significantly aggravate the condition she was already coming in with. So my opinion, my medical opinion was, no, I don't feel she could continuously pinch grip grasp um, or perform awkward wrist movements. Um, and that was preventing an injury to be obtained by the employer and also protective for her. Um, so also we look a little bit of uh, lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow in these exams as well. Thinking, sorry to take so much time, but a couple more things I'd like to draw attention to would be PFTs or spirometry. So these, for example, we think about our firefighters or other people that employees that have to wear respirators. So they can complete an OSHA respirator questionnaire, which should be completed annually. And then we can um, do assessments should there be a need to find out their pulmonary function. So the other thing that I would like to bring up at this time, so I've been asked at times to develop specific skills assessment. So um, perhaps I could do a foot evaluation, should that be a need? Um, I'm happy to further work um, with your, your company on developing a specific medically um, medically reasonable testing that we could do in clinic, should that be of need, we can work together on that. So thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, another question we have here is for Andrew. Um, in college, we did personality tests. I assume um, this is not acceptable in today's day and age. What about Gallup assessments? Can't say that I'm familiar with the Gallup assessment. Can speak to personality based assessments. Actually, believe it or not, it's uh, I'm going to give you a highly qualified statement. Is it lawful? It is lawful so long as it doesn't create a disparate impact. 
the reason that I need, I say it doesn't create a disparate impact is it's going to be really hard, I think, to persuade a court that a personality assessment is the least discriminatory alternative to ensure a harmonious workplace, something along those lines. But it is not threshold by and of itself unlawful or inappropriate. And it doesn't fall foul in and of itself of the ADA or the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act, unless, of course, there's some sort of allegation that they have a disability that prevents them from taking the test effectively in some way, and it becomes a barrier to entry to the position. That being said, I urge employers, as with everything, uh, before you consider making that a portion of the assessment, I, I ask you to look at the research, not because I am skeptical that they work. I, I don't know anything about them. I'm a lawyer. I merely am saying I don't frequently advise my clients to adopt the imposition of some sort of test or policy or uh, or or pre-screening process that may end up screening out candidates that they may want to see at the end of the day. And to the extent that you're doing that, because that is a screening out process fundamentally, uh, well, my question would be, do you like the economic impact of that? Can you do with having fewer candidates for the job based on what it is? And then I would use that to guide the analysis of whether or not I actually do it. There are practical considerations, but the legal side isn't where you're going to see the majority of those concerns. Makes great sense. Um, the last question I believe is for you as well, Andrew. Um, are there any examples you can give of wrongful termination as a result of a new hire testing? Oh, yes. Uh, primarily, uh, I see the litigation happening all the time in the context of um, physical fitness evaluations, especially general physical fitness evaluations, especially for positions that require candidates to have a diverse set of different physical skills. Where do I see it primarily? Police and fire. I see it all the time. Those departments usually are very, very, very old. They usually have maybe an academy with entrance standards, something along those lines. And then we've got this entire process of doing their 40 yard dash time, doing the amount of times they can do push ups, doing the amount of times they can do sit ups. And then all of a sudden it's like, OK, well, are all of those actually job related or consistent with business necessity? Because you're darn sure we're going to have different standards for male and female employees. So then as a result, is it the least discriminatory alternative? Yes, it happens all the time. I wish that it didn't. I wish I could tell my employers, no, go for it. You have a open free range to determine exactly what your positions require and then exactly what tests must be administered. But you do need to follow those steps in order to ensure that you're not on the other side of a lawsuit. Now, the EEOC used to be hot to trot for these. I haven't seen that as much, but around uh, so around the time I started practicing law. So 07 to 12, I would say, 20, you know, 20, 2007 to 2012, you saw a lot of EEOC activity in this space. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we've got a final question um, from Rich Delu, wondering um, if you could go ahead, Rich. Uh, this question's for Andy, and uh, this is based on a real case, but uh, something that was brought to my attention with the fact that if you had a FFD test and it was uh, based on the job description, 50 pound limit, but the doc puts in, hey, this person can at least work up to 25 pounds. So now let's look at the employer. The employer has a injection press mold machine shop and they have 10 presses and they have operators and the job description is not a press one operator, not a press two operator, they're press operators and this employer rotates them. Now there's one machine out of the 10 that nobody likes to do because it got to lift 50 pounds. So now this person that can't lift the 50 pounds gets excluded and now you've got the un your other union members complaining of the fact that this one's getting preferential treatment. So in this situation, it, this person's already hired, they're working nine out, you know, 11 out of 12 machines. What's the employer's recourse at this point? Well, the first thing that I would do would be, obviously, you've got a bunch of nesting issues. The first issue is, what does the job description say? If they're required to do a rotation, then the job requirement should be the threshold at the highest strength requirement machine. If that's your position, if the position of this employer is, 
they must do a rotation. Now, what I'll tell you is that if we get in, let's imagine a lawsuit, what's going to be asked of that employer? Well, that employer is going to be asked, are you sure you need to do a rotation or is that the easiest thing to do with the union? Are you sure that you couldn't kick them some other sort of benefit and then you'd be able to negotiate it? Because that isn't going to pass the muster in terms of it being consistent with business necessity. So I would say you've got a couple of nesting issues here. This is really sort of a labor relations question disguised as an FFD question, because in this particular case, yeah, is a reasonable accommodation just allowing an exclusion for this one employee to do that thing? Probably. And that's probably what I would recommend doing. And yeah, are you going to get pushback from the union as a result of it? You also are going to get pushback from the union as a result of it. How do you balance out those various harms? Well, I think you've either got to pick a side. Either you got to say, we're going to make exceptions or we won't for that rotation system. To the extent we really feel like it is essential, we must have the rotation system. Well, then the 50 pound lifting description goes on that job description. Your FFD screens out anybody that can't do it or offers a reasonable accommodation to anyone who can't do it. And then they get screened out as a result of that. And you ride or die with it and deal with the union. Or alternatively, you make the exceptions at which point in time, then you have to negotiate that out and you have to take the griping from the other union members. That labor relations is sort of the, um, it, it, it looks like a red herring here, but this is actually a labor relations question effectively because that's where the impediment is going to come from once they've picked a decision about which way they want to, which way they want to bend it. And that will, of course, be required based on the injection molding process. I don't know how that works for that employer, but how essential is it? That's what I would do. I would ask the operations manager and I would also ask an HR person, how essential is it that this gets rotated? If you're telling me that it is a bedrock, it absolutely must happen, I could think of one employer that does, for example, injection molding in an ultra high temperature environment, and they're like, no, 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 we need to rotate them, otherwise it is a health risk for folks. Well, then the lifting requirement needs to be 50 pounds, and that person can't do the job anymore, and then the union has a point. Or is it just nobody really likes to use the machine, and as a result, we're going to get grumpy guys if we we're going to not allow this one guy to do it. Well, then that becomes a labor relations issue. We're going to have to deal with a grumpy union. There are methods of doing that, but that's really a topic for another day. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, I probably shouldn't have fired that person. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you, then just as, a, yeah, yeah, just as a follow on a little bit earlier, something about a uh, stand up test. Uh, what I always used to do on job descriptions was because most factory work requires people to stand almost all the time there's very little that they can sit so i always had on the uh, job description expected to stand uh extended periods of time and i ac actually had one person that just couldn't do it after a while and uh you know within the probationary period i uh you know had to terminate their employment involuntarily so that was good <laughs> okay just checking <laughs> thank you Thank you, Rich. I think we're close to time. Are there any other questions or comments the panelists would like to make? Natalie, go ahead. I would just like to take the time to thank everybody for their time and questions um, in gathering today. Um, also, I would like to introduce uh, a few of my colleagues here. One is my right-hand woman, Lindsay Minima. She's uh, our, one of our PAs here that is also involved in leadership, and we're very thankful to have her, and she's a complete asset to our team. Also, we have Dan Adams, our nurse case manager. If you could wave hi, Dan. There we go. He wears myriad hats and is also a great asset to our team and um, is always willing to speak with employers with further questions. So thank you again, and I will leave it open to Terry again. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, if there's further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We will plan to send the recording and the slide deck in an email um, for you to reference at a later date. Thank you very much.